Let's begin with prayer. Uh, and the, some of the sisters are going to Newtown to be with uh, some of the families right now who are suffering because of the, the massacre on Friday. So they asked us to uh, pray for them. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Father, we come before you in thanksgiving for this great day, this Gaudete Sunday. We recognize, Lord, that there are many who are not rejoicing at this time. In fact, they may be in deep depression. They may feel devastated. Their lives will never be the same. We know you understand that better than any of us. And so we ask you to be with them. We ask you to accompany these sisters. And they would be uh, just instruments of your presence, uh, your silent love during this difficult time. We pray for you at the repose of all the victims, uh, the repose of the, the perpetrator for mercy on his soul. Pray for deep healing and that somehow, Lord, you would bring good out of a situation that you can only bring good out of. Our Father. So the reason I bring that up is because um, I, I didn't want to give I didn't want to give the impression that that wasn't part of the consideration. Would that it becomes part of the consideration? Um, you know that charity grows in this, and charity and knowledge are so connected. So we grow in the knowledge that wow, there is this amazing like creature of God before me, male or female, you know, depending on who we are. And um, she's not an object. She's more than a body. He's more than a body. They have a soul. They have a spirit. They have uh, an eternal destiny. God and Father had a plan for their life. Um, and I'm not allowed to uh, interrupt that uh, or to destroy that. So the decision I'm making is good for me, it's good for my wife and kids, it's good for my relationship with God, and it's good for my relationship with her, even if I don't know her. So we spent a lot of time thinking about the emotions this weekend, and that's a good thing, but as I sort of lamented last night and this morning, like this is just part of the picture. Would that we had like 30 days together. So we, could, we could try to give the whole plan. But part of it is that intellectual formation, which is why a group like this is just so great. You know, the, like theology of the body, the, the magisterium of the church is so important for us. Um, so those are the types of things that the intellect um, can, 
can enlighten us on. So the more that we we come to know um, about the teaching of the church and about ourselves, um, the more informed that the intellect will be and the more effective it will be in guiding our emotions. Um, and then the other example, you know, you're with your family at the zoo and a tiger breaks loose. Um, I, yeah, I didn't. I definitely didn't want to say that, that fear wasn't an appropriate response. I mean, in situations like that, it's the whole fight or flight thing. And sometimes you need to decide. Maybe flight would have been the best thing. So fear is important because it, it, can, it contains information. At the very least, this is a dangerous situation. And it's good to know that. It's good to feel that. Um, and maybe the best move in that situation is to grab your wife and kids and run. Or maybe not. Um, but the reason I bring that up is because, let's say, it's not. It's not so much that like the intellect uh, calls on the emotion of courage. The emotion of courage just happens. That's why it's important to be able to feel all of it. Our, our emotions just happen. Um, so it could be that I'm feeling fear, um, but I'm also feeling uh, courage at the same time. Um, you know, we can call on virtues. Uh, we can call upon the grace of God. But again, our heart is leading the way, so we're responding to the heart. The intellect is responding to the heart. It's like it gets a phone call. Need some help down here. So the intellect comes down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, and, and, and if I'm, I just have to say, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, just clarify. When you talk about the heart and the emotions, are you talking about the same thing, or is the heart the will? I, I, no, in a sense, yeah. in, in this situation, I am. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the heart's a big topic in theology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. and so sometimes it's the will, sometimes it's its own separate faculty. That's another weekend, but when it, yeah, for, for the purposes of this discussion, um, I was talking about you know, the, uh, the emotions and the intuitive knowing that we have. Um, so there is a so strangely there's a supremacy, a primacy to like the intellect and will, but they're not the first movers. So I, I guess that's the point that I that I want to make uh, here. Um, so is that clear as mud? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Is now I have one question up here. Are there more? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'll just randomly go through these. When do you know? You're ready for a relationship. Um, that's a good question. I think what you're looking for is uh, human maturity, um, and you're also looking for spiritual maturity. We can, we can expand those a little bit. But um, so again, uh, you know, what is what does human maturity look like, uh, which includes emotional maturity, intellectual maturity? Well, on an emotional level, again, it's someone who. Uh, has been given the gift of themselves. They've been able to receive that. Uh, they're aware of their goodness. Um, you know, the, the battle with self-hatred has been one more or less. I mean, that's kind of a struggle because of our fallen human nature. Um, but, and, and there's some emotional possession and freedom there. Uh, I'm free to be me. I'm, I'm certainly free to feel me. And when appropriate, I'm, I'm free to express me. Again, I'm, and we're not seeking perfection here. We're going to mess up. Sometimes we're going to blow up. Sometimes we're not going to speak when we should. But there's a general maturity there. And in relationships, there's a freedom to, to be me, to be frank and honest. Um, that's just like the brief emotional landscape. You know, the, the intellectual maturity that, that I have a knowledge of my faith. Uh, and that knowledge has led to um, an increasing love relationship with the Lord. Again, it touches my emotional life, but that... We can't ignore the intellectual component. Certainly can't ignore prayer. Uh, then I'm, I'm somewhat of a disciplined Christian, disciplined Catholic, uh, who understands that ultimately it takes three to get married. Uh, like that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's just a brief, a brief answer. But and then and see, and this is this type of maturity. It's going to save you from. linking up, dating an immature person. So mature people know what they want, and they know what they deserve. And they don't settle. So that's really important. Amen. This was a, a good... So, okay, I'll just read it. I hope it's okay to read the whole thing. 
Uh, I was raised by my mother to be very independent. Please elaborate on independence not being a natural way for a woman. If I possess myself, I would not like to lose myself. Please elaborate on this. Very good question. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I appreciate that. So again, just want to reemphasize that last night um, we were speaking on the level of general principles, um, and uh, but the way they're lived out, you know, it's it's nuanced, it's concrete, it's situational. Um, so let's start from the beginning. We emphasized beginning on Friday night that all of us um, are unique and alone. And that's part of God's design. He wants it that way. And it's actually that uniqueness, that aloneness in a good sense, uh, that recognition that uh, you know, it, in and of myself, I'm good apart from my relationship to another person because God has made me that way. And I've accepted that. I've welcomed that. I'm in possession of that. It's actually that, that uniqueness and aloneness that prepares me for communion. So... When, when I said last night, or when Dr. Tarub said last night uh, through me that, that independence is not the natural way um, for a woman, I wasn't denying uh, the need to, um, to possess oneself, to know oneself, to know one's selves, um, however you say that, uh, goodness and worth and love. But it's just the recognition that that gift of the possession of oneself is meant for self-gift, especially when it comes to women. Again, we can see this on a biological level, we can see it on a psychological level, and we can see it on a spiritual level, um, that, that fundament, the, the fundamental disposition of woman is receptive. So she's made to receive another. Um, so we don't, and, and in, this, in these relationships, which are based upon self-gift, we don't lose ourselves in the sense of ourselves being destroyed, but um, we, recognizing our uniqueness, um, we also recognize our incompleteness and the fact that we're completed in another. Um, and so you do lose that incompleteness by giving yourself to another person. Um, so again, it's kind of the difference. There's, there's a couple different ways of looking at independence and freedom. Like our society would say, you know, I'm independent and free, so I can do whatever you know what I want. But the uh, Christian, Catholic, philosophical, psychological, theological point of view would say, I am free and independent, so that I can make a gift to myself. And in making that gift to the other and receiving the gift of the other, I'm completed. And that's beautiful. And again, the marriage relationship mirrors or images the relationship of Christ in the church. And this is what takes place on a spiritual level with Christ in the church. Does that make sense? I just want to like make a comment that came to mind because that's something that I struggled with. Sure. Um, I, I just think about it in a way of like dependency is sometimes good because Christ depended on God for power to go through with his passion. You know, at that moment in Gethsemane, he literally said, you know, yeah. I can't do this without you. Right. Like, he was independent in who he was, but he was dependent in the need of, of the Father. That's it. You know? So it's a dependency that, that helps you grow, doesn't diminish you and oppress you as a person. That's right. It's, it's independence for the sake of dependence. Yeah. Right. It's just something that, you know, as a woman, as a Hispanic woman, you have to learn. Yeah. So it's hard to get out of it. It's about the gift. You give yourself to become yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, so, somewhat related. If man is meant to stand unique and alone, is one forever incomplete if never married? Great question. Um, I mean, the short answer is no, or not necessarily. Um, there are a myriad of reasons uh, for not getting married. Some of the positive ones would be religious life, or priesthood, right? Um, I don't consider myself uh, incomplete uh, because uh, because I'm not married and I never will be married. I will never um, experience the real gift and blessing 
of that relationship, of that sacrament, um, in a human way. But in a sense, I'm, you know, as a as consecrated religious and as a priest, I'm, I'm, I'm united to Christ in a very special way. And in that, I share in his spousal relationship with the church. Um, you know, marriage images to us Christ's relationship with the church. Um, and this heavenly marriage with the Trinity. But religious life, we just sort of step around that sacramental sign. We already have like one foot in heaven. Like we're, what, we're, what our life is showing is like, hey, we're all going somewhere. Whether we're married or not. And that ultimately, even if you participate in that married completeness, you're still incomplete until you're married to God. Until you experience that divine union. So it doesn't matter how great your marriage is. Here it is, and how much it shows the love of Christ in the church. Every human being is, de is destined to the wedding feast of the Lamb. So the whole book of Revelation, which we've been reading over the last few weeks, we're all destined for that. That's where our ultimate completeness will come from. I, I love this line from uh, Catherine Doherty, because she used to say, you know, she was married twice uh, in the church, and, and she said one of the greatest pains in marriage was that... Um, she was never able to fully know her husband, and he was never able to fully know her. So, so we do speak, of, you know, we've been speaking about emotional unity and this real two and two and one love. But there is that again, we're unique and, and alone in our core. There is that part of our core that that no other human being can really know. That's that's part of the suffering of marriage and relationships, but that's also the part of us that, that opens us up to the deepest encounter with God that's possible. And it's a reminder to us that, you know. While we're created for another, we're created for another. Amen. These are all the same question. Okay. Same question. Please clarify the heart leads the mind, but the intellect leads the emotions. Okay. Okay. Um, one way, so one way we can look at it, so the question is, you know, the heart leads the mind, but then how does the intellect lead the emotions? Um, one way that question can be answered is, um, you know, we can look at the emotions or our, our sensitive appetite as like the first mover. Um, you know, it's like triage, right? Or uh, a call center. Like the call comes in, you know, hello, Verizon, can I help you? And, uh, and so, I think it's them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're on hold for 17 minutes. Well, that's what you got. So we have this uh, experience of, you know, sensory goods. So, you know, again, let's say pizza. Wow, this awesome pizza. It's got the works on it. And uh, I really, really want that. Um, so the first experience I have is this, this, uh, this response to the sensory good. I love pizza. I'm attracted to it, and I have this desire. Um, the the problem is, it's a fast day. And yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and my superior actually wants us to save the pizza for tomorrow. He's just cooking it today. You know, he, I mean, he doesn't see me. I'm walking through the kitchen alone. And, um, and so, uh, so my heart is leading the way. Um, it's, but it's alerting the mind, you know, come on down, we need to have a conversation, you know, and again, then the mind tells me, or the intellect tells me, uh, okay, this is good, and you're attracted to this is good, um, but um, whatever joy you experience at eating that right now, it's going to be kind of mixed with sorrow and guilt, because uh, today's a fast day, and you know that, you committed yourself to this life, you know that fasting, done with the proper intention, brings you closer to the Lord, it's going to bring you that deeper happiness that you desire. Um, so, the, uh, the reasonable thing to do is to say no to this right now. You know you're going to get it tomorrow. So, we say no. So, that, that's one way that the heart is the first responder. Um, but another reason, kind of a, a deeper reason, is that, again, we're created for happiness. So, the reason the heart has primacy is because that's, that's the place where we feel it. That's the place of loving encounter with God and others. And so, our mind is meant to serve that. So we can also look at the answer to this question in that way, like, um, you know, the mind is really meant to, the, the mind guides the emotions, but that's really a service done to the emotions. Well, imagine if the mind didn't show up. Uh, I mean, sometimes it doesn't, right? That's the problem with depression, things of that sort. 
but the just because um, the mind is a higher power and the will is, you know, it's the super motor, it's a higher power, doesn't mean they're not serving the emotions or serving our heart. They're ultimately meant to serve our happiness. Does that make sense? So they come in service of the emotions, in service of the heart. And, and they're, they're able to, to tell the heart, you know, again, in this piece of example, okay, that's good desire. It might bring you a little bit of happiness, but that's going to be a tainted happiness. If you want happiness, let's say no to that right now. It's really serving my heart. You with me? Yes. Okay. Can I clarify that anymore? You sure? Okay. I want you to give an example. Okay. We have to use our minds, problem solve first, how can we be ordered correctly according to God's natural order? You've spoken of how emotions should be lived out in principle. Please give us some tips on what to do when we have not been living this way. What are some indications for reversing the side effects? So, I mean, the first thing, really, that it's not magic and there's not a method. Everything I've been describing this weekend, again, in, uh, in, the, in the progressively mature person, it becomes more and more spontaneous, right? Like, you know, you get, you, you, you get your car tuned up, or your guitar tuned up, right? You, you, you tune the guitar, and, and everything's working well, and then as you're, as you're jamming, you're not thinking about the different component parts. It's just happening. Or the car, you, know, you get it tuned up, like, and you turn on the ignition, and like eight zillion things in your engine happen. But it's all just working together. It's spontaneous. Uh, that, so that's the ideal, and we, all, we always need to see that, like, this is, this is what we're shooting for. Now, we're not there. Well, I mean, there, there isn't a secret method for getting there. Um, on a human level, we, we need to, to begin to give ourselves permission just to feel this stuff. And it's going to be scary. Um, but, again, uh, this is the way that God has created us, and we want to live in His order. Uh, so we begin, we begin to feel this stuff. And maybe some stuff is built up, so what we're feeling is really strong. Uh, and maybe it's a little messy. And again, we're not going to do this perfectly. And um, sometimes we're going to express these things in, in inappropriate ways. And that's okay. I mean, we have a loving God who's ready to welcome us back. You know, anytime. So we, we can go to confession. We can ask for forgiveness from other people. Um, but, it, you know, all the time, all this time, this, this messy growth, uh, we're growing in freedom. You think of a little child. We don't. We don't punish the child for falling when they're learning to walk. Uh, and you're like, well, okay, falling when learning to walk is not a sin. But if, you know, even though we're 25, but, you know, if our hearts are still the hearts of a teenager, then we need to give them freedom, you know, to start moving in that direction um, so that they can catch up with our bodies, so they can catch up with our age. Um, yeah, we, we just we really need to pass through this. So you give yourself permission to feel. Hopefully, you have a safe place in the way of relationships. You have good friends who will let you be yourself, um, and you can even practice on them. You know, like, hey, I don't appreciate that. You know, please, when you say that, I feel this. Like, why did you say that? Um, and uh, you know, you live in New York. Practice in traffic. Use the horn. <laughs> <laughs> And, I mean, not just for the sake of, like, again, do whatever you want, but, like, people are crazy. Sometimes people need to hear the horn, so just take, you know, take advantage of that. Like, it's okay to feel this stuff. <laughs> once, we become, once we become more and more comfortable with feeling it, then we begin to practice expressing it. But also, Jesus is your friend in this process. He is the safe place. He is the person who you can share anything with. You know, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus, I'm really angry. Jesus, I'm really afraid. You know, because ultimately he's the healer. No matter where the healing comes from. Uh, relationships, counseling, whatever. He is the healer. And so the, the, the place where we can be very open and very free is before him. And just to practice, like just you know, praying as you can, not as you can. Praying as your heart leads you, not as you think you're supposed to be. Does that help? Someone for baby. Okay, good segue. Segue. I understand how the intellect needs to guide my emotions to proper action in the future. What about past hurts and wounds? If there are still emotions regarding past hurts, does this necessarily mean 
uh, they have been repressed? Uh, not necessarily. Um, you know, sometimes, depending on, on how deep the wounding is, um, you know, we might be angry for a long time, or we might be afraid for a long time. And again, one of the things I've been trying to emphasize this week is really derive that weight. Your heart knows better than your mind how long this needs to go. Again, the intellect moves in to guide the emotions, but simply guiding it. Sometimes, sometimes that guidance means, uh, okay, I recognize that this is something that you, you just, well, it always means, um, you know, recognizing that you need to feel this. And you need to ride that wave all the way. So even when we say no to that pizza in front of us, I'm not saying no to feeling that desire. I might say no and go on about my day but still longing for that pizza. I might think about that pizza for the next hour. <laughs> and that, but seriously, so saying no does not mean I'm not going to feel that anymore. It just means I'm not going to gratify that desire in that way. So now let's go to this example, the past hurts and wounds. Um, if you've suffered injustices, if you haven't been loved um, in the way that, um, that all of us deserve to be loved, um, and if there's anger or other emotions attached to that, um, you need to feel them if you want to experience healing, if you want to experience psychic and spiritual wholeness. Um, it doesn't mean you need to express them, but you do need to, to heal them. And, and in a certain sense, um, we don't really need to worry um, about whether you know this is repressed or not. I mean, just to start feeling it and just letting it happen. But that's the first thing the intellect is going to say. Um, and then again, we bring these wounds before the Lord. So it's like, okay, um, you know, some guy cut me off in traffic today and I really went to listen. I was angry, but I was like, this was like out of control angry. Um, and so we come before Jesus and we say, oh, you know, that was, that was strong. It seems stronger than it need to be. So what's going on now? You know, we just bring our hearts before him. We're like, please reveal and heal the root wound. Because once that root wound is healed, then, then these, these things start to link up, you know, emotions with one another, emotions with the intellect and will, and that order starts to come in. So, but, but even if the emotion is disordered, you need to feel it. But you bring it before the Lord. And, and sometimes we're not in a place to really work through those emotions until we're a little bit more spiritually stable in yep. our life or whatever. So yep. Sometimes the Lord brings them up later yep. because we couldn't handle it. That That's time. totally true. I mean, it's like, it's just one of the facts of trauma. That like when you experience a significant trauma, mm -hmm. like part of you just starts to shut down. And that's a defense mechanism, especially in children. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, that's a very good point that um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's severe repression here. It just means that um, the person wasn't capable for, for one reason or another of processing this horrible situation. I mean, they're going to experience just a new town. Family, you know, people young and old. Uh, it might take a while just to feel unfrozen so that they can begin to play. Yeah, good Okay, uh, you mentioned that marriage is meant to be an emotional union. Should two people in marriage emotionally be responsible for one another, if not why? Um, okay, um, not totally sure what the question means, but I think I understand. Um, I think what I was trying to get across last night is the responsibility that bears upon us entering into marriage is um, is to bring that to bring our own personal openness and vulnerability, you know, trusting that that's going to allow the other to be open. I'm not responsible for your emotional reactions. Um, the reason I say that is because sometimes conversations that need to take place don't take place because you're afraid the other person is going to freak out. Um, and um, even if that's a legitimate concern, and even if that might happen, 
Um, it doesn't always mean that the conversation should be in place. Um, there may be times when it should. Uh, you know, like I just understand that my wife and my husband is just not ready uh, for this right now. But the flip side is, well, I just need to say this.